Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we are so pleased to be able to bring you tonight's program. And I'm Robin with the Ramsey County Historical Society. I'm gonna turn it over to Peter Ratcliffe at the Eastside Freedom Library to say a few words. And um, I'll have an introduction when he's finished and then we'll get started with Bill Lindeke. Great. So thank you, Robin, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is our biggest crowd yet, which is exciting. Um, if you're not familiar with the Eastside Freedom Library, our mission is to inspire solidarity, work for justice, and advocate for equity for all. Uh, we're now almost eight years old, um, and we have a collection of more than 26,000 books focused in immigration, labor, and social justice history. Um, we're using those books with middle and high school kids doing History Day projects, but we would love for you to come in. Um, during the pandemic, we ask that you reach out and make an appointment first um, and uh, commit to being masked, um, but we look forward to seeing you. Um, we're excited to be doing this series in 2022 with our friends at Ramsey County Historical Society and our friends at the Roseville Public Library, a part of the Ramsey County Library System. Uh, our theme for 2022 is Making Minnesota, and we will be trying to bring the stories of Indigenous people, immigrants, migrants, workers, women, bring stories that have been on the margins into the center. Um, if you are interested in the work we're doing, we want to encourage you to sign up for our twice a month electronic newsletter. You can find a link for that on our website under Get Involved. Click on mailing list and give us your email. Two newsletters a month, that's all we'll clutter your, your inbox with. Um, I want to also thank my colleague Bailey Ethier, who is helping with the tech tonight. Um, and I also want to mention that in February, on February 10th, our presentation will be by a young scholar named Jane Henderson. Jane grew up here, but went off to the University of California at Berkeley, pursuing a PhD in geography. Um, she's writing about African American spaces and activism in the Twin Cities. And her presentation on February 10th will be looking through the lens provided by the life of Harriet Scott, the partner of Dred Scott. Um, and Jane is looking at relationships between African Americans and indigenous Americans um, in the mid 19th century Minnesota. So again, thank you for joining us. I know some of you are frustrated that we've asked you to turn off your uh, cameras. We will hopefully uh, have time um, to reveal ourselves to each other uh, after the formal part of the program is over. We found that this is a great way to do community building uh, and we hope we'll stay, you'll stay with us uh, through the whole evening. So I'm gonna turn things back to my colleague, Robin. Thank you, Peter. Um, we appreciate our sponsorship and our partnership with the Eastside Freedom Library and with Ramsey County Libraries in Roseville. Um, Judy Woodward is here tonight. She helps us over at the library get these programs set up. And again, a big thank you to Peter, to Bailey, and everyone at the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Eastside Freedom Library. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining the Ramsey County Historical Society, including our quarterly magazine, our award-winning magazine, Ramsey County History. And you can find out more about RCHS on our website, which is on the slide on your screen. You guys want the thumbnail video up? www.rchs.com. And we also have the link up there for the Eastside Freedom Library. And I just want to remind everybody, please keep your microphones turned off. 
Um, and as Peter mentioned, after the program, we'll have some questions. You can put your questions in the chat. And um, after Bill's done with those, then we can hopefully turn on everybody's microphones and um, cameras so we can share. But we have a big crowd tonight and we wanna keep the feedback down. Um, when you go to our websites, you can see our upcoming programs. As Peter mentioned, we have a great one coming up on February 10th on Harriet Scott with Jane Henderson and a lot more programs coming up. Um, the Ramsey County Historical Society would like to acknowledge the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Mekoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website. Again, it's www.rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota Mekoche. We are committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community, and we're pleased to bring you tonight's program. As Peter mentioned, in 2022, we're working to bring you programs focused on the Making Minnesota series, which is going to explore those untold stories, histories, and experiences, including um, some wonderful programs that we are working on, on immigration, Indigenous peoples, African American peoples, and so forth. But I'd like to thank our presenter tonight. Um, Bill Lindeke is an urban geographer and writer who focuses on how our environments shape our lives. Bill wrote Min Post Cityscapes column from 2014 to 2017, has written articles on local food and drink history for City Pages and The Growler, and has taught urban geography at the University of Minnesota and Metro State University. He writes a local urban blog at Twin Cities Sidewalks and is a member of the St. Paul, was a member of the St. Paul Planning Commission. He is the author of Minneapolis St. Paul Then and Now and the co-author of Closing Time Saloons, Tavern, and Watering Holes of the Twin Cities with Andy Stern event. And it's a great book. And Bill and Andy have come and talked about that book. And that video is available on our YouTube channel. And Bill's most recent book is up on the screen, St. Paul, an Urban Bio Biography, A Concise History of St. Paul. And I'm going to put the link for that book with our partner, Subtext Books, in the chat in just a minute. And I'd like to urge everybody to check out Subtext Books. Um, they are our partner, and they're a wonderful small bookstore in downtown St. Paul, and we'd like to support them um, for all of our History Revealed programs. So um, I'm going to put that in the chat and I'm gonna turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Robin. Uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction from Robin um, and from Peter. Uh, I'm Bill and he, I um, wrote the book, St. Paul Urban Biography and I'll be talking about it today, but um, I'll just, I, I wanted to mention a quick anecdote about the Eastside Freedom Library and how important they are. Um, I, I wrote this book and researched it all during the 2020 pandemic. And I was sort of hoping to use the Minnesota Historical Society um, research room, the Gale Family Library, it's called, uh, and dig into all of the material they have on the history of St. Paul throughout 2020, but I couldn't because it closed as did all libraries um, in, in the Twin Cities during the pandemic outbreak. But Peter and the Eastside Freedom Library were gracious enough to let me uh, let me in and go through their collection on St. Paul history, uh, even though it was really early and and this was um, you know very unusual circumstance. So it was one of the few places I got to actually do research in archives with books, and I'm really grateful to this day. Um, so thanks for the support of of Peter and the Eastside Freedom Library. So check out the rest of the lineup; it sounds great. I'll just go through um, my, my book here and, and um, introduce it. This is sort of part two of a talk that happened um, 
I think a few months ago, I did sort of part one of, of this, of my book on St. Paul history. Um, and uh, the, the chapters that I'll be focusing on here are the second half of the book. But specifically, I was interested in the call to action and the theme of the talking series for um, 2022 here about centering stories of indigenous people, African-Americans, migrants, and immigrants. Um, this is again a, an idea I stole from Peter Ratcliffe, or I guess he gave it to me generously, um, which was to use the murals in the St. Paul City Hall. I don't know how many of you have been to City Hall, Ramsey County Courthouse, and seen the, the council chambers where they meet. Um, it's the buildings from 1932, and the murals on the wall were designed by a, um, a De Great Depression um, WPA era muralist named John Norton. But they all feature uh, prominently a great white man right at the center of each of the each of the four panels, and these are two of the four panels here, um, and uh, marginalized around the edges of the um, of the murals are the figures of other people um, who are, are often in positions of sort of um, not having much power or or sway uh, uh, compared to the white men that are prominent in the in the um, in the murals. The only woman that's depicted in the murals, for example, is there getting off the train uh, in the bottom there. Um, and there are a couple African-American people depicted in this history of St. Paul and um, some Native American people. But for the most part, um, it's not a, um, it doesn't center the, the story of the city around the stories of the literally marginalized um, people of color and um, American Indian folks. So that was an, interesting place to jump off how to think about St. Paul history. And I really appreciated Peter's idea. And I talk about it in my introduction. Partly it's, it's good because um, the St. Paul City Council and Ramsey County Board decided uh, about two years ago that the murals needed to be changed because of the way that they sort of symbolize and, and contain the public space that the council chambers should be. And so um, the murals today have been covered over, they're, they're still beneath the surface of this new artwork that is um, changing every couple of years. But if you look at them now, there's uh, they got commissions from different art artists to come and update the murals with less um, sort of patriarchal and, and um, white dominated histories and, and symbols, which I think is really cool. So that's sort of how I wanted the book to work. Um, the stories that I would tell would ho hopefully not be just a series of all the great white men that have, um, you know, made St. Paul what it is today, but as much as possible to try to talk about um, some of the other figures that helped make St. Paul um, what it is. Uh, and so if, if you were here for the last lecture, the last talk, um, two months ago about the book, I did mention a few stories from early St. Paul history about um, sort of non-white folks uh, who were at the, um, who, who played a role in St. Paul. Um, one of the groups was the, uh, the, the Meti ox cart drivers. So this was an early group of people that did a lot of the trade between St. Paul and um, Canada and, and points to the north in the Red River Valley. Um, along these these river trails that um, were actually a really important way that goods and 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 St. Paul merchants um, traded with other settlements, um, and most of the drivers of these uh, these ox carts were Metis, um, sort of mixed race uh, men who would take these wagons up and down from St. Paul, hundreds of miles to the north, to uh, the Selkirk and Pembina colonies. Um, so that, that's an interesting story that I talked about last time. Um, I also mentioned, uh, let's see, um, a couple other things. And, and I went over a little bit of the Native American history, which I'll get into here in a second. Um, but first I wanted to just briefly, I, I also at the end of the, um, I talked about the railroads and the way the railroads were important for St. Paul's growth. And um, the first railroad locomotive that had ever been in St. Paul history was called the William Crooks. Um, it arrived on a, on a steamboat up the river in, 19, in 1861 and began the first railroad service in St. Paul between St. Paul and Minneapolis. Um, and so I had been reading about this train uh, 
and I was in Duluth this last weekend um, and saw the train itself. They, they remodeled, rehabbed the William Crooks. Um, and I was just uh, delighted to see that the, the railroad had been, the, the actual locomotive that had been the first locomotive in St. Paul and in Minnesota history was still around and you can go see it. And there's, I was at the museum like three days ago and uh, there's my little daughter, Ruthie. So I had to throw in a picture of her um, but that'll be all, all Ruthie content for today. She's nine months old and she enjoyed the train. I don't think as much as I did, but she, she, she liked it, I think. But anyway, um, talking about Native American history, I hope, uh, most, I hope everyone here will spend a lot of time trying to delve into that. Um, and I know I have done my best. There's thankfully a lot more resources that you can go to about some of the Dakota and Ojibwe and Ho-Chunk histories of Minnesota. And when you talk about St. Paul specifically, you gotta get into a lot of the Dakota history. Um, the, the book that I wrote is not really about that. And I don't think really, I'm the person that should be telling that story, but I talked talk about it as much as I could. The part that I wanted to focus on was how deeply the sort of leaders and founders of St. Paul um, relied on and sort of used their power um, they used their connections to in Native Americans and Dakota people specifically or, and other tribes um, as ways to get a lot of money and land and, and become wealthy and powerful people. Um, so this was true for a lot of the, the people you hear about in, in St. Paul history. Uh, Henry Sibley is, is famous, um, famously linked and intertwined with history of Dakota people. And um, you can learn more about that in my previous talk or in other, other, many other places. Um, Alexander Ramsey sort of um, led the charge, um, sort of dispossessing Dakota people in Minnesota. Um, but even guys like Henry Rice, Henry Rice was a key figure in St. Paul history in the 19th century, but he got his start um, with the Indian trade with the Ho-Chunk uh, tribe. And um, that's where how he made most of his first bunch of money that then he went on to invest in land deals in St. Paul, um, which, so, so a lot of these guys used Indian and, and Dakota and, and other tribe connections and annuities as ways to then funnel it into um, land speculation, which was how you made a lot of money. Norman Kitson's another St. Paul legendary figure who um, made a lot of money um, as an Indian agent, as Rob, Rob Wales mentions here, and, um, and trading with uh, different tribes. And um, so this was a key part of how St. Paul got its start. Um, James J. Hill also, uh, he's a little bit later, but his railroads were deeply connected to um, sort of exploiting uh, the power dynamic between the federal government and uh, Native American people. So there was a recent biography of James J. Hill that called his Great Northern Railroad, um, quote, one of the most Indian subsidized railroads in North America. Um, and he was really proud of the fact that his railroad wasn't subsidized by the government, unlike most of the other ones that were built in the time. But um, he did rely on uh, a whole series of legal um, ways to take um, tribal land in order to build the railroad um, that he did, the Great Northern Railroad. So basically the point is, is that anyone who made a lot of money and made their name in St. Paul did so um, on, on Native American land and by um, uh, exploiting the power relationships. Um, but yeah, I'll just go through and talk really quickly now. It's already 7.20 um, about a bunch of stories that I found from my book research that I think fit the bill of um, highlighting and, and centering marginalized people. Um, and here's, here's a funny story from the 1850s in St. Paul. So this was a, something I hadn't heard of before, but there was this uh, um, little incident called the Cornstalk War. So this is before, um, this is after the 1851 treaty, but before the Civil War and before the 1862 Dakota conflict, um, St. Paul tensions between the white settlers and the Ojibwe people living to the north of the city um, were often a problem. And so um, 
at some point, something happened between some settlers and um, Ojibwe uh, hunting party in 1857. And um, people in St. Paul ended up forming a city militia that um, were gonna go up north and quote, do something about the Native American people who were living um, north of St. Paul. So a bunch of, um, I'm assuming they're younger, people got their guns and went up and confronted an Ojibwe hunting party in Chisago County. Um, and there was a conflict and people were shot. Um, one Ojibwe man and one white man from St. Paul were both killed. And the militia, self-appointed militia came back with five Ojibwe men as captives that they were then um, going to present as, uh, as you know, criminals to the St. Paul leaders. Um, at this period, St. Paul sort of was still run by fur trade veterans who knew quite a lot about Dakota and Ojibwe um, relationships and, and how, um, why they were hunting in the woods, for example. So they were sort of horrified by the fact that this militia had popped up and, and tried to take justice into their own hands and quietly released the captives, including the supposed shooter, a man named Shagoba, an Ojibwe man, um, and were really wanted to apologize to them for the fact that this fake militia had gone up and, and arrested them. And so they, they um, enlisted a, a fur trade veteran who was a St. Paul politician named Joe Roulette to um, take the, the, the Ojibwe men out on the town that night in St. Paul. And they went to a theater show and, and to dinner. And um, that was their way of apologizing. It was sort of um, an embarrassing moment in St. Paul uh, and tribal relations. But then this doesn't last very long. 1862 is famously the year where the, um, the Dakota conflict um, happens in the Minnesota River Valley. And St. Paul has a role here too as sort of the big um, center for news and for um, creating like a hysteria around what had happened and how, how things had gone. So after the, um, the way this whole story, everyone should, should learn this history, but the um, Henry Sibley goes and, and, and arrests, captures Dakota people and has a trial, a military trial out, out to the West. And um, he wants to hang 200, over 200 Dakota men um, for the, the conflict and, and, and what happened between the white people and Dakota people. And uh, President Lincoln at the time decided that um, only 38 people would be hung. And um, the district attorney, attorney of Ramsey County and uh, citizens of St. Paul were really upset about this. They wanted many more people to be killed by the, the government in, in Minnesota. So there was this open letter from the citizens of St. Paul published in the newspaper um, in St. Paul here about um, why the decision to give people leniency was so so wrong. And so St. Paul sort of becomes the, the um, megaphone for calling for genocide of Dakota people in Minnesota in this period. So that's not great. Um, there's a lot more to this story, of course, but the, the point is that when you're thinking about St. Paul and what this place means and where we are and what the you know history of this place is, I think it's really important to acknowledge all of the things that we acknowledge, that Robin acknowledged at the beginning here, but also to um, recenter the landscape and sacred places like Mounts Park um, around Dakota people that have been living in this place for thousands thousands of years. Um, and so Mounds Park is, is one of those places. It's a cemetery. And I think it was interesting that signs were just put up about a year or two ago, um, declaring that Mounds Park is not just a park, but is in fact a cemetery and it should be treated with more reverence than we have in the past in St. Paul. You could say the same thing about um, another sacred site in, for the Dakota people that's just at the base of that, um, at that bluff there on the east side, La Wakan Tipi, um, which, uh, in Dakota means spirit cave or spirit dwelling place. Um, and this was a sacred site that has been in Dakota culture and, 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 and by according to some uh, traditions, the center of the Dakota universe for um, hundreds or thousands of years, nobody really knows exactly how long, um, but was uh, definitely 
abused and um, practically destroyed by the white settlers who uh, lived in St. Paul and came there, um, especially after the railroads came in. So just this last year, I was uh, lucky enough to be at this ceremony um, where there was a groundbreaking for a new Dakota cultural center that's going to be built at the base of the bluff near, um, it's called Bruce Fento Nature Sanctuary today, but it's, it's sort of between downtown and Mounds Park. And there was a beautiful ceremony with um, native dancing and a long list of notable folks, including many of the Dakota and other Native American groups and other um, people in St. Paul who have been working on getting this built um, for a long, long time. So that's good to see. Um, let's see, other fun stories from the 19th century. I, one person that I think is really important for everyone to know about is a, um, an early St. Paul settler. Everyone knows about Pig's Eye Parant, but no one really talks about James Thompson. Unfortunately, there's not a picture of him, but he was one of the first people to settle in, down, in St. Paul near where Lower Landing is located today, um, way back in the 1840s. And so he had a land claim there. He has an interesting life story. He arrived in Minnesota as a slave in 1827. Um, he married a Dakota woman um, when he was younger um, and then got bought by a missionary who would come up to um, the Minnesota territory um, who wanted to convert the Dakota people to um, Christianity. And so the fact that James, James Thompson um, spoke Dakota was really helpful for these missionaries. They didn't speak Dakota. And so it was, they didn't do a very good job converting anyone, but they did um, purchase James Thompson and free him from slavery. Um, they paid $1,200 for him and bought him from this other person. And um, James Thompson then works as a missionary for the um, Methodists for a little while. And uh, it turns out that it doesn't go too well. And at some point he stops working for them and becomes the ferry operator. Now this is a ferry that goes from, in this picture from the fort, where the fort bridge is, um, so Highland over to Fort Snelling, but there was other ferries where downtown St. Paul is located that went across the Mississippi and James Thompson ran that ferry for a number of years. Um, he had one of the first land claims and famously fought with another early um, St. Paul settler, an Irish, Irishman named Ed Phelan. So Lake Phelan is named after that guy. Um, and he was cantankerous and James and um, Ed fought because Ed Phelan um, stole Jim Thompson's pig. Uh, and then uh, apparently Jim was a good fighter wrestler because he, he, he won, he won the wrestling match. This is how people uh, settled differences back in St. Paul in the 19th century. And uh, so anyway, James Thompson goes on and um, helps found the first Methodist church in St. Paul. Um, I th there it is, uh, it's, it's not there anymore. Um, but uh, he then um, moved to Newport and then he um, ended up dying in Nebraska. His son went to live on the Santee Sioux Reservation and that's where Jim Thompson ends up at the end of his life. So he has a really interesting life. Um, as an early St. Paul settler. And a lot of people don't talk about the fact that there were um, African-Americans here in, in Minnesota from the, in St. Paul from the very beginning. Let's see. Um, yeah, so I was, there's also a, a cool story about the um, Underground Railroad that I wanted to mention. Um, during, before the Civil War, St. Paul was the northern terminus of the Mississippi River traffic. So for that reason, it was um, a key point on the Underground Railroad up the Mississippi River, slaves escaping from um, the slave states uh, south of Missouri uh, would, would end up in St. Paul at the end. Um, this actually proved to be a little bit of a point of tension for the business people in St. Paul. Um, but First, before I get to that, I'll talk just a little bit about the, the, the Underground Railroad. Um, black, early Black St. Paul residents um, often were barbers. Um, and this is an example of one of, it's not a picture of, of the guy, but William Taylor was a early Black St. Paul citizen who um, ran a barber shop. And apparently um, this was sort of a profession that um, black, black men could, could do in St. Paul 
in this period, um, it was acceptable and socially or whatever. So um, there's this little advertisement at the top that was in the newspapers. And his barbershop was, um, this was a pen and ink drawing of probably what it looked like in the 1850s. But the barbers had sort of a, um, a slippery place in society because they talked to people of all different groups um, and could also um, apparently also were often good musicians and so socialized and played um, music around around St. Paul in the early pre-Civil War days. Um, and so they were kind of perfect for the Underground Railroad. So um, William Taylor was one of those and he used his shop to help fugitive slaves and get them out of town where they would um, go north to freedom, uh, often to Canada. Um, there was one example where it didn't go so well. So um, one of the tensions was that the, uh, the Underground Railroad and abolitionist movement in St. Paul and in Minneapolis were at odds with the um, tourism industry. Um, at this point, uh, slaveholding Southern tourists were a big cash cow for people who ran hotels. Um, and this is a little bit later in time, but you get the idea of what an uh, early hotel might have looked like in pre-Civil War period. And so they wanted to attract the Southern tourists and the idea that, um, that abolitionists would liberate um, slaves if they were up in St. Paul was against what they believed um, and it would not help them make money. So um, there was sort of a uh, tension around that. And in Minneapolis, there was famous case where um, abolitionists and black workers, free black, black people in Minneapolis had liberated and um, helped slaves escape while they were um, on, helping with the tour while they were visiting as part of these tourists um tourist trade and um that that that, ha that happened in st paul as well um in 18 um what year i think 1857 um right after the big uh financial panic had bankrupted everyone so folks were a little bit desperate a body servant um a servant a slave named henry sparks who was owned by a, a tourist visiting to St. Paul named Martha Prince. Um, basically some black workers and probably barbers um, just told him he was free and that he could leave and they would help him escape. And he said, that sounds great. And so um, he, uh, he gets out of town um, and they get as far as uh, Point Prescott, which is like Prescott, Hastings, Wisconsin, um, at which point they get caught and um, brought back into town and uh, it, it doesn't go too well. Um, the police chief and the mayor testified um, that uh, um, that he he uh, he was not allowed to be to be freed. So that's sort of um, there's definitely some back and forth around uh, the kind of morality question versus the desire to make money in St. Paul around the issue of slavery. Um, the probably most embarrassing example of that was this guy, Charles McCubbin, the McCubbin Street is named after this, 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 this guy. He was an early property owner in sort of the, uh, in, in St. Paul. And he was, he was a legislator in the 18, um, 18, what, 1860. And he proposed a law that would legalize slavery in Minnesota. Um, but only between the months of May and October. So it legalized slavery just for visiting Southern tourists. Um, and it did not pass. It was defeated in the Minnesota Senate 24 to two, um, but it's sort of embarrassing. And uh, that was sort of, that was the dynamics pre-Civil War around um, how much uh, slavery um, was pitted against sort of economic um, booster and opportunism. Um, Another sort of dark story in St. Paul history happens a few years later during the Civil War. There is a um, group of escaped slaves from Missouri who um, all got off of this plantation. They were led by this fellow named Robert Hickman um, and who had built a makeshift barge uh, on the river. And um, I think it was the, the Missouri River at this point. But anyway, he gets over to uh, the Mississippi and is is trying to take this barge north up the river, but um, the river flows south and I don't know the barge, I don't know bar raft barging myself, but apparently it didn't go too well. They began floating south instead of north. 
and uh, people got pretty worried until Passing Steamboat, obviously run by a um, union sympathizing steam captain, uh, towed them north up to St. Paul. So there was 76 people, escaped slaves on the raft, and the steamboat called the Northerner brought them up north to St. Paul, where they thought it would be safe to drop them off. Um, unfortunately, uh, the news of this arrival of escaped slaves and African Americans um, reached people in St. Paul, and they there were a lot of rumors and um, an unwelcoming attitude, specifically from the Irish wage laborers who were um, working in Lower Town and viewed the escaped slaves as um, competition or something. And so there was, uh, on the docks, there was sort of a big crowd um, who were upset about the arrival of this raft and the police showed up and they were trying to separate the crowd from the um, refugees. And so the northern of the boat and ended up uh, keep keeping them, keep towing them all the way to Fort Snelling and where they got off and they got settled here in St. Paul eventually. Um, but that's just an example of, again, the, the, the way that the economic tensions at the time or, or of any period really pit people against each other across racial groups. Um, that guy, Robert Hickman, who led this, this exodus, ended up um, starting, and that group of people, African-American people, started the, this, this church, the Pilgrim Baptist Church, that is still around today. So I bike through my neighborhood and go past this church. It's on, on Chatsworth, I think, in Central, in the old Rondo neighborhood. And that's not the original church from the 1860s, but um, it's the same congregation. So that's kind of cool. And Hickman eventually ends up becoming the, the priest of the, of the Pilgrim Baptist Church. Let's see. Um, I'll skip over some of these pictures. The Irish actually do um, a lot of helpful things though too. So I don't wanna pick on the Irish, uh, Irish St. Paulites. Um, there's a wonderful book by Mary Lethard Wingard uh, called Claiming the City. That's a history of sort of labor relations in St. Paul. And she mentions how Irish St. Paulites um, often were able to use um, events like St. Patrick's Day parades to um, and, and societies like the Order of Tiburnians to overcome racial divides. And so it tells a good anecdote about an early Asian American, um, Chinese American, St. Paulite who was given honorary Irish citizenship during a celebration and is welcomed into Irish community. Um, and that's kind of neat. Uh, the first St. Patrick's Day parade um, ends, up, en ends up getting a to be such a successful event. I think this is around 19, 1917, 1915, where um, uh, Archbishop John Ireland actually bans future St. Patrick's celebrations in St. Paul uh, because they, were, they got to be too rowdy and he was embarrassed. He was a, a teetotaler who um, encouraged sobriety. And so um, there was actually an official ban on St. Patrick's Day parades and celebrations in St. Paul from the early 1900s all the way till the, the 1960s. Let's see. Well, I need to kind of get skip a bunch of stuff here. Um, there was a big labor shortage in World War One. At the end of my last talk, I sort of end on um, 1917 is what I view as sort of a key key moment where. Uh, race becomes a far more problematic thing in St. Paul and in probably in the, a lot of other cities. Um, and it's kind of interesting why that happens. And I'd love to learn more about this if anyone has some good resources on this. Um, but uh, yeah, 1917, um, World War One. there is a labor shortage and it um, prompts a lot of industries like, for example, the stockyards in South St. Paul to seek out um, workers anywhere they can get them. And so um, one way that they do that is to bring in uh, workers from Eastern Europe. So the Croatian Hall, this is my wedding where I got married, um, dates back to this period where um, industries were trying to bring immigrants in from parts of the world. Um, this is also coincidental with like the Great Migration story um, 
And so the, the movement of African-Americans North starts to happen in this early 20th century um, in, in mass. And so um, I feel like a lot of the racial problems and tensions start to emerge as um, new workers stop being white and, and the idea that whiteness like becomes this new concept and category that people start to focus on. Um, for African-American community in St. Paul, uh, has a real strong connection to the railroad. So if you were on the Great Migration, you would take the railroad up north to um, St. Paul, for example. And a lot of the, um, these are old photos of the Union Depot back in its heyday. I like this one a lot of the, the baby and the guy smoking a cigarette. But one of the only um, photos of an African-American red cap that I could find here at the Union Depot from this period. So a lot of the early St. Paul African-American men worked for the railroads it was one of the biggest employers in the city as as red caps or porters um you basically worked you're on call 24 hours a day for people in the sleeper cars and you worked for tips um for the most i think that was it but the tips could be really good and they they did get um unionized eventually and and had some clout and so compared to life as a sharecropper it was actually a pretty good job um although the hours were grueling and um but the this sort of period where um, race, racial difference starts to inscribe itself um, dates to this same period in the early 20th century. Um, and one of the ways that that happens is through uh, restrictive covenants, which if you look at when these start to be placed on, on mortgage deeds, it's right around the same period of the, um, you know, around World War I and afterward. Um, before that point, you don't see a lot of racial covenants on mortgages, but after World War I, you start to see it be very common in new developments in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and most cities in the country, where if you um, want to sell your house, you cannot sell it to a non-white person. And here's an example from Massachusetts. Um, the local story about this is uh, in St. Paul that's very famous, um, and you can all look this up later, is the story of the Francis, the Francis family, um, Nellie and William Francis, who um, most black St. Paulites lived in the Rondo community or in the downtown area. Um, and there was sort of a unspoken, um, you know, rules about where, where you could live um, that were often done through um, sort of social pressure. But uh, Nellie Francis was a sort of determined civil rights advocate. And um, they were both sort of middle class and had good jobs working at big companies in downtown St. Paul. And so they tried to move to one of the white neighborhoods in town, the Mac Grove area. Um, at which point, uh, for years, neighbors um, organized community groups to try to keep them out. And the um, white neighbors who didn't want black people in their neighborhood had marches in front of the Francis home, would make phone calls, um, harassing phone calls to them all the time and burn crosses in their yard. And um, basically the Francis is moving, trying to move to this house had to hire a security guard <laughs> um, to keep people, to keep themselves safe. And um, the way that this standoff ended, they were both stubborn, and but you can't imagine that they had a good time living in the macro of neighborhood in this period. Um, William Francis was appointed to um, be an under ambassador in the State Department in Liberia, Africa. So they end up um, getting this job and leaving St. Paul. And uh, that's uh, that was three years where they lived in the macro of neighborhood. But this kind of um, race, invisible racial lines were all through the city. And if you read the history of Rondo neighborhood, or if you um, talk to older folks, uh, you, will, you will hear where those lines were. For example, Selby Avenue and Lexington Parkway were two of the lines that um, the Rondo histories were sort of the, the white black divide, dividing lines for where people could live in the 1950s. Um, that's another story that everyone should know about St. Paul. Uh, so I, I was mentioned a little bit, I'm jumping around historically and I apologize, but it's, um, it's hard to fit all these, um, these, these stories into a coherent narrative without recentering sort of white people in the, in the story, which I'm trying not to do today. 
Um, another sort of component to this labor shortage that happens around World War I is that there's agricultural workers are in short supply because a lot of the um, you know, white workers are, are drafted and overseas fighting um, in the war. So um, there's a big increase of Mexican migration to Minnesota. Um, my cat wants to get out. Uh, let's see. And so a lot of um, Mexican workers end up moving from Mexico or from Texas to Minnesota to come work for the sugar beet, sugar beet fat, uh, farms. And uh, that's, they, they work there obviously during the warm time. And in the winter, they, um, the housing that the sugar beet industry had given them was very, very bad and not warm at all. It's un, 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 uninsulated. So a lot of the sugar beet workers end up coming with their families to live in St. Paul. Um, and that's how St. Paul becomes sort of a Mexican community right around the same period, sort of right around 1920 is when that starts happening in significant numbers. And this is one of the early pictures of the St. Paul Mexican American community that I could find. Um, hopefully there's more out there somebody can see, but you can see this is a parade um, with, uh, with sombreros and, and a cool float, um, presumably a Catholic um, icon, icon float of some kind. Um, you can see if you go to the Cinco de Mayo festival, which I don't know if they had one last year or not, but um, you can see a lot of the same sorts of traditions still happening in the same exact place down on the west side, um, which I recommend everyone do. Here's one of my favorite photos that I found of the west side, the old west side flats area. So the flats area refers to um, the part of St. Paul that is between the Mississippi River and the bluff um, that is now today in an, in an industrial park, but historically uh, was sort of the most immigrant community, immigrant friendly community of that part of St. Paul, where people with very few resources could find um, places to live and, and work to do. And I like this picture a lot because you can see the Mexican bar in the background. And I talk a little bit about this bar in my book, um, Closing Time. So if anyone wants to learn more about it, you can. Um, and then these little kids walking down the sidewalk. Um, I really recommend that everyone read Gordon Parks's autobiography. It's called um, A Choice of Weapons. He, I think, is another really interesting figure in St. Paul history. Um, I'm going to skip him right now, though. So <laughs> it's too bad. Uh, but yeah, check this out. Check out Gordon Parks's biography. He is awesome. He spent his childhood using sort of St. Paul as a home base. Um, he was sort of homeless. He ends up um, traveling the country as a musician and then getting winding up in Chicago and having near-death experiences. And then he ends up working on the railroad as a, as a porter, the same kind of um, red cap job that I was talking about a little bit ago. And that's where he develops his love for photography and ends up um, becoming one of the America's most important photographers, um, especially dealing with race. And he, in his book, Choice of Weapons, has some kind of nice things to say about St. Paul. It seems like he had a fine enough time here um, compared to some other places that he lived throughout his life. Um, I wanted to really focus in for the next few minutes though about some of the policy um, problems and sort of how we got to our segregated city that exists today and, and, and how that happened from a sort of governmental perspective. There was a big study done, the first sort of social science study of St. Paul dates to 1917, again, the same year that I'm, I think things sort of start to shift. Um, the Wilder Foundation hired an early sociologist to come in and study why St. Paul was, um, you know, had problems, social problems. And he ends up, um, sort of looking at a lot of the housing and connecting that to people's ethnicity. Um, so it's not really a class-based analysis. It's not about how poverty happens, but it's about sort of whether you own your home and what race you are and whether you live um, in a big family or in a small nuclear family or what kind of family you have. And then there's a lot of focus on bathrooms. So the, the report, which you can find online, uses sort of poverty, shocking images of poverty to, um, I, I view it, pathologize groups of people in specific neighborhoods like the West Side Flats. 
So this is an example of that. Um, and there ends up being this sort of subtle narrative. It's not very subtle, actually. Um, connecting density, apartments, and diversity to um, squalor and, you know, maybe to some extent that was that was a link, but the way that this ends up playing out in St. Paul um, policy-wise is to make it much harder for um, people of color, working class folks to find places to live and find um, housing in, in St. Paul by sort of um, justifying the demolition of a lot of these places, these neighborhoods. So um, this was an early study that, that sets the groundwork for that. Um, the St. Paul then uh, passes a um, the first city plan in 1922 that then has a lot of the same sorts of uh, goals and ideals in it. This same kind of logic extends into the 1930s after the Great Depression. Um, with uh, here's another research um, book that you can you can check out. It's called The Social um, Saga of Two Cities by Calvin Schmidt, who's another early sociologist, and he. Um, there's a lot of really interesting maps and um, analysis, social analysis of who's living in St. Paul and in which neighborhoods. Um, but it has that same kind of um, subtext about linking uh, communities to poverty without sort of analyzing how they got to be that way. And the map that everyone looks at that's sort of famous is this race class map that Schmid creates where it maps out sort of which neighborhoods are good and which ones are bad. and um, you can see here's zooming in a little bit uh, how he analyzed the different parts of the city. Um, let's see. And so this sort of leads directly into the redlining maps um, in the 1930s that um, the federal government uh, does in St. Paul and every city around the country where they um, analyze and, and describe different communities according to how white they are, how diverse they are, what kind of housing there is, if it's apartments or if it's single family homes or if there's rental housing and grade everything according to how investment worthy it is. And this becomes the basis for who gets mortgage assistance and who doesn't and leads to sort of the racial inequalities. It's one of the number one factors that creates the wealth inequality in America is this sort of uh, access to home loans that dates back to this period where, um, where neighborhoods are graded and evaluated in this way. Okay. Um, that's sort of my wonky part um, of, of this. And there's so much more to unpack here and I'm not gonna be able to get to it today, but you can see one of the effects of this is that St. Paul and Ramsey County, you can, this is mostly St. Paul, by the way, the population of greater Ramsey County in the 1940s was pretty small. It just becomes much more segregated. Um, it, it used to be a little bit more diverse, um, integrated with each other and uh, over this period of time, um, this is research done by St. Kate's, by the way, but um, it becomes more segregated. Um, so this all leads into a lot of the urban renewal and freeway construction problems that, um, that I am very fond of talking about. And I don't know how many of you know all the stories. Um, the Rondo is the most famous of the neighborhoods that get destroyed. I like looking at these early photos, though, pre-urban renewal, pre-freeway pre of what the city looked like and how sort of connected it all was. Um, and so if you read my book, uh, chapter six in particular, it starts off by talking about what these communities were like around the edge of downtown um, and what it might've been like to walk, for example, from the cathedral to the Capitol through this working class neighborhood. So if you look at that same spot today, you'll see that, um, let's skip ahead a little bit, that uh, there's like, well, I guess I don't have that slide in here there's hardly anything left of, of that old community. And so it's really interesting to think about which neighborhoods were destroyed and which ones weren't and why that happened. Um, let's see, Sweet Hollow is, um, was set on fire and um, demolished in this. This neighborhood didn't have any plumbing, admittedly, but um, it was also a place where uh, people of color and immigrants could find homes and, and live. Little Italy is a similar one by the river. Uh, another of the most famous areas that was um, demolished and transformed by the city was the West Side Flats that I had talked about. So this is what the community used to look like before it became an industrial park that it is today. Um, let's see, what can I get to before we have to wrap up? I guess 
here's one more picture showing how radically um, the landscape around uh, the most dense and working class part of the city was transformed. So this is the Seven Corners area, just um, between the cathedral and downtown. You can see that big intersection where Excel Center is today. Um, that's the Seven Corners intersection. Um, this is what it looks like today. So uh, from a satellite perspective, and there's the before picture and there's the after picture. So these are the kinds of communities that get obliterated by um, federal and local policy in this period. Um, the famous case is the Rondo community, of course, where the freeway gets, um, there was a debate that theoretically existed between uh, city planners and the the state planners about where to put the freeway. And um, the alternate route would have skipped a lot of the, most of the um, African-American neighborhood, but instead the, the freeway was put right through the middle of the African-American community, the Rondo community. Um, and here's just a few pictures of what that meant. So Lexington University, um, basically the freeway went right through the middle of this photo at a diagonal. Here's another one showing the right of way that was taken out for, for the 94 freeway. Uh, let's see. So yeah, doing really fast, uh, the rest of this history that I had lined up here. Um, in the 1960s, I think triggered in part by so much of the destruction that had happened to the communities, there was a lot of racial tension around um, uh, like in most cities, and St. Paul had a lot of the same problems. Um, Selby Avenue becomes sort of a, um, a flashpoint for, um, for uh, white black divide, you know, as, it, as, it, as I described that it, it had been historically. And um, there was a famous incident in 1968 called the Stem Hall riots or Stem Hall um, incident, I guess I would say, where, um, the St. Paul police end up barricading this this hall, this dance hall that it um, that was having a big party with most of the attendants were were black, um, and um, shooting tear gas into the hall and then um, causing this extremely troubling uh, um, event for the young people that were there. Um, a lot of people were were hit by the, the police. Um, and uh, this leads to sort of um, looting and damage on Selby Avenue in particular, um, where businesses are, 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 are hurt. So this it's kind of um, pre shades of a lot of the police and uh, community conflict that's been happening recently. Um, it's really never gone away. Another famous story from this period is the um, killing of a police officer. So I read this book, it's kind of interesting. It's a story I hadn't heard as a 40 year old about a, a police officer who was shot um, on Hague Avenue in the same area. Um, and then the Dayton's bombing, I don't have any slides in here showing the Dayton's bombing, but that's another um, interesting slash horrible story about St. Paul in this period. And it, it all sort of comes around full circle with stories like Philando Castile on the demonstration. This is a photo I took of the sidewalk outside Summit Avenue a few years ago, um, let's see. So in my book, I talk a little bit about uh, sort of racial turf, St. Paul, and um, the, the story that um, Melvin Carter Jr. talks about as a police officer about Rice Street. And um, that's something that rings true for me growing up on Rice Street, um, growing up uh, living on Rice Street as I did for about uh, five years. But I end the book talking about sort of immigration and change and, and sort of trying to be more up hopeful and, and how places like St. Paul that have, that are now majority um, non-white cities are actually um, so important for the future of America. Um, and I specifically focus on the Hmong community. Uh, Eastside Freedom Library, by the way, has, I think, a, a large collection of these Hmong tapestries that tell the story of um, the Hmong refugee movement from Laos to, to America. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I think that's, that's correct. Um, so talking about the Hmong community who start coming to uh, St. Paul around 19, uh, 1975, 1976, the first Hmong immigrants end up in St. Paul. And um, it's how important groups like the Hmong and other immigrant groups have been to revitalizing um, and, and, and um, 
reinvigorating a lot of the commercial corridors of the city. This is uh, photos from a book called Frogtown by a photographer, Wing Young Huey. Um, and this is kind of interesting because I live in Frogtown now. Um, so to read this book and go through the, the photographs and look at them is just such an interesting um, time capsule from the early 90s. Um, but if you, um, I actually did a story for the Twin Cities Daily Planet years ago um, where they sent me to the Hmong J4 Freedom Festival, which is an annual um, celebration of Hmong freedom that happens on July 4th. So it's similar to um, the 4th of July, but it's got a very different twist because it's 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 in the Hmong context. And it was it's also a sports tournament and it was really interesting to go to that. So um, I encourage everyone to go visit that or to go to Hmong Village or Hmong Town. They're two very large ethnic Hmong markets that are in St. Paul. They're fascinating places. This is one of the coolest spots in the Hmong Village on the east side where they have a mural in the background showing what Laos, um, showing Laos and uh, and then sort of connecting that to the community that exists in St. Paul today. Let's see, so I had some slides about sort of inequality in St. Paul today and where um, white and black divides exist and where poverty is concentrated in St. Paul. And then also trying to emphasize very strongly that the um, a lot of the segregation that exists in St. Paul is actually St. Paul versus suburban segregation and how much wealth exists in the suburbs. And there was a question here about um, St. Paul being more diverse. And I think there's an interesting thing if you look at this chart of the population um, change in Minneapolis versus St. Paul. If you look at the blue line, Minneapolis declined in population from its peak a lot more than St. Paul did. And I think that's an interesting question um, uh, about why that difference exists. And I, I, there's a lot of reasons that we could start speculating about, but it's kind of cool. Um, this is sort of a racial dot map of the Twin Cities Metro and the, the red dots are white people and the, the blue dots are African-Americans, the green dots are Asian-Americans. You can see how racially segregated the Twin Cities really is um, at a glance in this map. So I think that's important. Um, but I end my book, uh, St. Paul and Urban Biography talking about some of the work that's now being done to try to um, redress some of the mistakes we've made in the mid 20th century and in the, even before that. So this is um, a man named Marvin Anderson, who is have been the leader, one of the leaders of the efforts to start Rondo Days and to um, create a museum and a, a, a plaza and a land bridge on 90, I-94 corridor in the Rondo community. And I end by talking about farmers markets and how great they are and why farmers markets are sort of, I think, the vision for the best that St. Paul can be, um, the way that they sort of include everybody and um, bring everyone together in a wonderful community and healthy way and have delicious food. So I'm looking forward to the end of winter and farmers markets being back. Um, anyway, I'll stop there. I think uh, I do see some great questions and I don't know if you wanted to how you wanted to do this, Rob? You want me to just, just go through here? I can read them out, Bill, so they're on the recording. Um, okay. So Robert had a question. Um, I'm not going to read his whole comment. It's in the chat. But he wanted to ask if St. Paul was historically a city that developed neighborhoods from an immigration perspective more easily than Minneapolis, if that was your impression. Um. I don't know. I th the, the differences between Minneapolis and St. Paul are sort of really are, are really interesting. Minneapolis was much wealthier and their industry, their industrial base required a lot more workers of maybe lesser skill than St. Paul had a lot of small businesses that um, a little more higher skilled labor. And so there was sort of a tendency in Minneapolis to be more abusive towards their um, working class neighborhoods. Um, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of immigration, immigration, immigrant neighborhoods in, in Minneapolis as well, and a lot of Catholic communities in Minneapolis as well. But in general, um, I think St. Paul was was more oriented around Catholic identity and um, less about sort of large industrial workforces. So there was two related questions. Um, one, what was the most interesting or surprising thing you discovered while researching your book? And the second one was, what is your favorite St. Paul neighborhood? Oh, um, 
instead of neighborhood, I want to say streets, like streets that I love in St. Paul are um, Payne Avenue. So go to Eastside Freedom Library and then um, walk up and down Payne Avenue. Cause it's one of the few streets that didn't get bulldozed like crazy um, after, you know, after the automobile was invented. It's still kind of narrow and has a lot of the 19th century uh, um, buildings on it. And then the diversity on Payne Avenue is still wonderful. And so in some ways it's the same as it always has been. It's an immigrant street um, that, that, that reflects the diversity of the city. Um, also love Selby Avenue. Um, it's wonderful. And I really like the way the cathedral sort of sits on one end and gives you a landmark at one end of the street. Let's see. Um, Is there anything else surprising or unexpected that you've yeah, found? <laughs> that's a tough one. I guess I, I, I really recommend, the thing that surprised me was how wonderful um, uh, Gordon Parks' book is. So I recommend that. Also, I guess I want to learn more about the, the, the Black Panther movement and uh, sort of 1968, 1970 uh, stuff. I think the first time I ever heard about the Dayton's bombing, I was just really surprised by that. And I, I haven't learned enough about it. I've, I've read a couple articles about it, but not. Um, I'd like to learn more about that. Um, there's some fun, surprising stuff. The one surprising uh, St. Paul story that, that everyone should know is that in 1965, I think, uh, there was a two-week period of time where Minneapolis and St. Paul were on different time zones, okay? So there was an hour earlier in Minneapolis than it was in St. Paul because there was a fight over who was going to do daylight savings time and who wasn't. So I think that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't heard that either. That's great. Um, Krista had a question about if you talked about parks, parks history, natural areas in this latest book. Yeah, I talk about Como Park specifically um, and the history of that park. And I don't get into a lot of other parks, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, the history of Como is really cool. Because it starts out as like it was actually called Sandy Lake originally in the nineteen in the eighteen fifties in the nineteenth century, um, and it was like really in the rural area at the you know really far from the city, um, and it was like a health resort with a little boating cabin you could go out, and then um, um, thanks to four sighted city leaders, uh, the city and county bought bought this what 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 is today's Coma Park in 1870s before the railroads came in and everything got developed and so it's really cool amenity in the middle of the city. Okay, does anybody else have any questions right now? We will um I want to thank Bill and I want to thank the Eastside Freedom Library and Ramsey County Libraries Roseville for their sponsorship and of course subtext books. And I will stop the recording in a second. But again, thank you, Bill, for coming back again. We appreciate you coming back uh, several times to cover My pleasure. just some of our St. Paul history. Um, I know there's a lot more that we can cover in, in an hour or two. This recording will be up on our YouTube channels in a few days, um, tomorrow or Monday or Tuesday, as soon as we can get that taken care of. And again, thank you everybody at the Eastside Freedom Library, Bailey and Peter, especially for um, joining in and taking care of this. So.